So welcome, uh, my name is Mary Jetton and I'm one of the co-founders along with Jules Miller of Evolve Law. Basically we're a community of legal technologists, um, companies like Thomson Reuters, one of our sponsors, law firms like Davis Wright Tremaine, another one of our founding members, uh, and we've gotten together to try to accelerate the pace of adoption of legal technology. This is our 15th event out of um, 16 for this event season, and we started last year with about 27 members, and now we're up to close to 90 members. So if you want more information about Evolve Law, our website is uh, in one of the next slides. So big thank you to our sponsors tonight, Thomson Reuters. This is the third event that we're doing with them and look for some um, blogging on this. And at all of our events, we have wonderful people that video and we put it on our, put it on our site. And then Davis Wright Tremaine, very, in the very beginning, Lynn um, from the New York office, sponsored the very first event here in New York where there were 20 something people and four companies and um, We've kind of just carried it on from there. And just really quickly, these are our upcoming events. We've learned a lot delivering almost 16 events after next Tuesday in San Francisco. So next year our events will be from September 13th in Atlanta, and then they'll go forward to um, November 15th, and then we'll take a break and we'll be back around Legal Tac with some exciting unconference and some other exciting news that will come out. We do have member-only mastermind sessions that we started, and those are, um, if you're interested in speaking at those, if you have something to add on sales or on storytelling, that type of thing, just let us know. So now I'm gonna turn it over to Ian, who is going to talk about a day in the life of a GC. Thank you, Mary, and thank you, of all the law, for putting the show together. Uh, so I'm um, Ian Kinnett, I'm legal director for Collective, we're uh, uh, one of the larger ad tech companies here in New York. Um, I joined about a couple months ago, before that I was uh, in-house at Westcon, large distrib IT distributor where I implemented a lot of legal ops, sort of using my passion for technology to just keep tra track of contracts overall, you know, make the department a little more efficient and uh, kind of led to this discovery of this incredible sort of opportunity in, in legal tech. So this may be one of the more nerdier things you see today, but it's the year 2020. Machine learning droids have infiltrated corporate legal departments of the galactic empire. Legal professionals struggle to coexist with this emergent artificially uh, intelligent race. Luckily, a handful of skilled millennial Jedi Knights have already mastered the new technology, learning to coexist with the legal droid armies and bringing freedom to lawyers and other legal departments across the galaxy. So this is sort of, you know, a day in the life of, um, a, I guess, a millennial general counsel. Um, 7 a.m. to 8 a.m. You wake up, do yoga, <laughs> drink your organic smoothie, you know, the health stuff. You do not check email. Um, the first tool, and what we, I think one theme you're going to see with legal technology is that it allows you to do more with less, takes uh, a lot of the drudgery work out of the practice of law, it actually will give you time to check in with yourself, be a little bit healthier, and so the mantra you know, for this slide is, you know, the Millennial General Counsel will use technology to make practice more efficient and will overall just be a healthier, happier human being and, and more focused going into the office. So we don't actually think about technology when we, when we wake up, we actually just kind of wake up. Um, 8 a.m. to 9 a.m., you start your driverless car, and it's obviously a Tesla of some kind, uh, and you've got your, your CMS, your contract management system, is already right there staring you in the face. Um, you've got an instant overview, overview of pending contracts, um, renewals, things that are uh, terminations, maybe negotiations. Uh, I'm not sure how many folks here, how many folks here are actually like in-house lawyers? Um, do you guys have a contract management system? You do, yeah. All the hands just went down, except for one sort of. Um, these are becoming, I mean, essential technology for legal departments. So uh, it's really shocking what I've actually seen out there. And people use shared drives um, and sometimes just Excel sheets. That's like your contract system is like uh, an Excel sheet that you need to manage. And, and so 
All that's just going to get put into a dashboard, and you'll be able to see that in your, in your Tesla. Uh, some of those companies there are companies that actually have pretty good contract management systems. I've implemented Aptis before, uh, which is a pretty good tool. Um, but our mantra here is our practice is not restricted by time and space. We can practice law anywhere through a cloud-hosted uh, contract management system. So that's our first hour of the day. Get to the office, and I boot up legal Slack. So I still haven't checked my email, because I, I actually don't think we're going to be using email in five years. Um, but you'll be uh, doing live drafting sessions uh, with your customers, doing documents in real time, uh, uh, possibly using blockchain to actually code um, contracts and contract terms into uh, a structured database for automatic execution. Um, I don't know a ton about blockchain, but it's, uh, it seems to be actually pretty uh, important for, for contract execution. So um, that's from the minority report, by the way. So you, you know, maybe you won't even, I'll just be like doing this, you won't even have a, a keyboard. But um, the mantra here is you practice in real time. We don't know what red lines are anymore. We're not going to send red lines. Uh, work will be completed quickly and collaboratively in uh, virtual environments. Um, and this is an example, uh, I think this is Concord. Uh, just, uh, this exists today, you know, it's basically a document with kind of people chatting there on the right and you know, you're, you're working in real time. You're not, you're not sending a document over and then waiting weeks uh, for that to come back and then red lines and all that stuff is going to go out the door. Um, so that's, uh, you just did a document, 10 a.m., uh, you get an urgent request from your, S, uh, your SVP of sales. Uh, I need an NDA. How many times do you hear that in House Council? Let's get this NDA done. You know, I need it done yesterday. Um, well, I would remind the SVP that in 2019, we uh, expanded automation to our NDAs. Uh, so my, sales, uh, my, my senior vice president of sales is able to generate, send, and sign the document all by himself. And then I spend the rest of the hour um, analyzing a critical data privacy matter. So I'm actually probably simple things like NDAs not even going to read uh, because uh, as I was actually just talking to a Jules, a lot of simple contracts are really just sort of really engineering questions. It's uh, does it have this? Does it not have this? What's our bandwidth for that term? Uh, so I really believe that NDAs, and there's companies like Shake right now, which, which, which are sort of doing the automated uh, drafting of simple agreements. Um, big, you know, big time contracts will still, you know, those won't be automated, but your, your everyday NDA, I mean, there's no reason why your sales lead right now can't just go out there and, and do that stuff in his or herself. So the mantra here is we, we actually empower our team to overcome legal obstacles, shorter sales cycles, and again, we're, we're happier. We're happier because of this. Um, Maybe now time to pay some bills at 11 a.m. I boot up my e-billing solution. Uh, Simple Legal is a really great company right now that's just got this space really nailed. Uh, transparency into my budget, uh, possible um, through big data, uh, transparency into what other law firms are actually uh, billing, uh, you know, billing in for my particular matter or type of matter. Uh, so I'll be able to approve my line items. No more paper, no more paper invoices. I mean, nothing really gets under my skin more than getting that really fat envelope from my outside counsel on that nice, thick, wasteful paper. Um, you know, I just, I don't even read that stuff. It's like, do it in a file. It's all going to be electronic billing, and I can pull the report down from my CEO meeting, and, uh, and there it is right there, sort of in one place. Uh, so that's, um, the mantra here is, we master the legal budget process, we don't accept paper invoices, and we always demand transparency and control over our legal spend. Um, all right, time to shift gears a little bit. Uh, we're, we've got a meeting with uh, my engineering team, and we're going to go uh, into our IP platform, and inv our invention management platform. Uh, we'll see a, 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 an instant status of our pending designs and patents and workflows. All of the actual work that goes into building the patent will be integrated with the design workflow, so we can actually work on the, fi the filing um, while we're working on the, on the design itself. Uh, and we can actually, um, and All Eagle is actually a company that's, that's really nailed this, we can actually file directly through the patent office, uh, right from my, my, uh, my, my minority report workstation. So um, that's pretty cool. You're not going to have to you know, make that call to your IP counsel and get that bill for maybe $1,000 just for you know, getting a report on, on your trademark status. or uh, uh, All that's going to be within your control. So we're not going to be beholden to costly IP firms for day-to-day -day IP portfolio management. All IP will be managed through workflows, workflows in a single platform accessible to the engineering teams. And then I go to lunch. Then we'll come back to lunch. 
uh, and there's a little AI, AI lawyer sitting right there. Um, come back from lunch, oh my gosh, I have 10 new contracts pending review. Um, maybe it's time to boot up my contract a analytics application, um, which will uh, boot the, I'll send these contracts into an application which will instantly uh, identify a ratio of rare, missing, or important clauses that are pre-configured, and I'll get a score for each contract that I'm working on. So the, I, it's kind of hard to see here, but that's like um, a score that says one uncommon clause, two missing clauses, and 20 important clauses, and it, that contract has a score of 64. So maybe based on the volume of, uh, of contracts that have come back uh, as particularly worrisome or not, I can outsource that to a, to a third party provider, uh, hire an Esquire, very great um, uh, source for, for outsource legal work, uh, great for enterprises. Um, companies doing the actual analytics, uh, LogEeks and Cure Systems are two that, that seem like they really get that space and it's, that's obviously just sort of uh, in day one uh, for that technology. So. Uh, we don't fear the AI. Um, we use the analytics software to, to actually shorten the contract life cycle and reduce time that we spend um, on mundane contract review. So then I'll do a coffee break, uh, four o'clock. This is the last hour of my day because we don't spend all day at the office anymore. We've got technology that makes our lives uh, easier. And I'll actually enjoy doing legal research. <laughs> I don't know how many people use Westlaw or um, some of the, the, more, the older uh, tools, but they're very manual. Uh, there's some really great companies now, Judicata, Ravel Law, Case Text, which have very interesting uh, things you can learn about your case. Uh, judge analytics is, is, a, is a big field now. You'll know everything about the judge who's handling your case, their favorite colors, uh, what arguments did they like, what arguments didn't they like. You know, um, that's a, a screenshot from a ju judge analytics widget, but that's just sort of a level of research now that um, that's becoming available to in-house attorneys. Um, you'll be able to actually um, take your legal research to the next level and identify the, those perfect cases and arguments to cite in your litigation. Research will become fun, and this is just an example of sort of what legal research will look like. It looks like now. I mean, that's actually a real screenshot from a, a real company right now, but it's more visual. The document is interactive. You can sort of, um, you know, navigate the the, uh, the case law, you know, much easier. So five o'clock rolls around, uh, and then it's time for happy hour with my stormtrooper squad. Um, and again, the theme here kind of is that we shouldn't fear all this technology and disruption. There's a lot of opportunity, as we all know, to make our practices better, but also you know, to be healthier, happier people. So may the legal tech be with you all, and that is a day in the life of a GC in the year 2020. Thank you, Ian, and I appreciate you calling me the jewels, by the way, at the, the beginning. Jewels. Yeah. 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 Uh, so uh, thank you, everyone. <laughs> uh, for those in-house counsel in the room, how many are like 50% of the way there here, at least? Anyone? Besides Ian? Yeah. Uh, you will be. Yeah. Okay. Right on. Um, so I'm going to now introduce our illustrious panel. We have an incredible group of people. I'm Jules. i co-founder of Hire and Esquire and also co-founder of Evolve Law. We're happy to have you all here. And we're going to talk about uh, the de uh, general counsel in uh, the tech savvy general counsel in the not too distant future. So 2020, what's going to be very common that's not common already, but that's going to, that's already kind of happening. So um, let's see if I can manage this. We're going to bring our panel out. So we're going to bring Ian back up. So Ian introduced himself a little bit, but he is also just named the Millennial GC. And so check out our, our Twitter feed. There's an article about him that's really cool. So he uh, is obviously legal director of, of Collective. He did uh, legal ops at a $6 billion global tech distributor. And he's implemented a ton of technology, which is, is interesting and awesome. And he's got lots of good stories to share. And then we ask everyone what their favorite lawyer is. So his favorite lawyer is Fr uh, Hank Palmer, who is Robert Downey Jr.'s character from The Judge, because he gets stuff done, and he's very unconventional, and he's emotionally invested, and he cares. So thank you. Um, we're going to bring out Ken Callender from Value Strategies. Um, so he works primarily with corporate legal departments, helping them get more value and predictability from their outside counsel relationships. So legal ops, process efficiency, um, but an emphasis on moving to 
value-based fee arrangements. So he's worked with some very cool companies like Uber and Snapchat and a lot of tech companies. He's based in the Bay Area. And prior to that, he spent 26 years at Hewlett Packard and was also the chief marketing officer at Davis Wright Tremaine, our friends in the audience here. And his favorite lawyer is John Frank. So he was the Yale Law professor who moved to Arizona. Um, he helped with Brown versus the Board of Education. And he took the Ernesto Miranda, I took Miranda decision to the Supreme Court, and it was also very, very supportive of women in law. So he had three really incredible, um, would you say, like proteges? Um, and you have to name them because I forgot to write them down. Sandra Day O'Connor, Janet Napolitano, and Mary Schroeder. Anyone know those people? Yeah. Um, and he also happens to be his wife's father. Uh, so Lawton Penn, come on out. Uh, so Lawton leads the DWT De Novo practice, which is her firm's dedicated innovation and legal solutions design team. After practicing law for an employment lawyer for 25 years, she's super excited to lead the brand new role, um, to lead the firm's efforts to modernize the delivery of legal services by leveraging technology, applying new staffing models, incorporating data analytics to deliver business insights and improve efficiencies. So she's done a lot of stuff at DWT, and she is, her favorite lawyer is Atticus Finch from To Kill a Mockingbird, who she just read with her eighth grader. Um, all right, Mike from Pearson, come on out. He's the Senior Vice President and Deputy General Counsel. You guys can sit down, by the way. Um, and pass one of those mics down. Uh, so that we have two. Um, he is responsible for litigation globally at Pearson, and as well as the legal groups that support various company functions, including compliance, technology, and corporate affairs. He was previously Associate General Counsel for Litigation and Employment at Coca-Cola, and was General Counsel for Texaco for 18 years, where he had uh, many sensitive litigation and employment issues, as we can imagine, and then helped with the merger to Chevron, with Chevron. And his favorite lawyer is Tom Hagen from The Godfather, who is the <laughs> ultimate tough in-house counsel job. <laughs> yeah, exactly, exactly. And finally, we have Joe Borstein. Uh, he's global, global director of Thomson Reuters Legal Managed Services, formerly known as Pangea 3, uh, where he manages a global team dedicated to counseling law firm and corporate clients on integrating and leveraging a workforce of a, a thousand talented full-time attorneys around the world. Um, he also writes a column called Alt Legal for Above the Law, which is great. And he was a litigator before that for Kazowitz, and his favorite lawyers all are his parents. So his mom was an NYU. <laughs> But they are kind of badass, so let me, let me tell you more. So his mom graduated NYU Lot 21 is just one of the handful of women in that class. And his dad is 76 and still owns and operates his law firm in Midtown Manhattan. And he sees how the rest of us, he, his dad looks at law like the rest of us should look at law. So solving problems for the future. Um, and uh, that he thinks that legal tech will bring back that idea of practicing the law and, and uh, solving problems. So let's get going, enough, about, uh, enough from me. So first question is, what do you see as the most exciting or maybe the most likely area of technology uh, that in-house councils will be adopting in the next three to five years? Well, I, like, I, was, I was talking a lot about contract management systems. Uh, I think that that's one that's really catching on because it broadly applies to most big legal departments. So I think automation, workflows, uh, and just getting a really solid contract database would be you know, a very hot space for in-house departments. I think Lawton had a good story, so I'll pass it over to Oh, dying to know what that story is. Oh, it was about um, firewalls. Oh, that's related to implementation and barriers. Yeah. <laughs> no, um, I, I, I think what I, so Ian, everything you said was so terrific and very reassuring and validating because I work with a, a team and we, I surveyed them all saying, you know, where are we going? What should we be watching for for in-house counsel? And they had two observations I think might be helpful just to start the conversation today. One is to sort of level set on what the problem is we're trying to solve because I think that then relates to a lot of the other questions that we're going to be looking at. and. Um, my impression is that in-house counsel, you used to come into a company because you had really specialized subject matter expertise and they thought that that would be valuable to have on the team. But now it seems like in-house counsel are expected to have business acumen to come with data to back up their intuition and their recommendations and to be able to process these huge volumes of legal work product efficiently and cost effectively. Um, the other concept, and then I'll talk about what I think we need to be working on. The other concept I think we need to keep in mind throughout the panel today 
is those stages of adoption. So you're going to have the real innovators. I haven't found a law firm or an in-house legal department that's ready to take that much risk. You're going to have early adopters, which are the folks that really want to use a technology advancement to gain a competitive advantage. And um, Google Zandor is kind of a really cool example of that. Um, and then you've got your early majority. And that's the group that looks around and says, we're not going to chase every fad, but we're really interested in something that might actually work and be useful. So when you think about what the problems are, are trying to solve for in-house counsel, knowing your own company's um, risk profile on the sort of adoption scale, what I would say is for the early majority, I think the most exciting work is around the supervised machine learning, being able to take um, unstructured data and in huge volumes pull out the most relevant prov provisions. So we're doing a lot of looking at that. Kira Systems, it's um, one that's come up in several conversations tonight, I think holds a lot of really interesting promise. Um, for the early majority, so those are the folks that are waiting to see it get tried and tested, I do agree, contract management systems. Shocking to me how many legal departments do not have a document management system. Any way to find a contract? Really interesting. So contract management systems, um, bringing e-discovery in-house, that's one where we've had a good wave that we've ridden and now the um, solutions are really quite sophisticated and I think a lot of legal departments may bring e-discovery in-house and not uh, try to do more of that themselves. And then the other one I think is managed services. So we're spending a lot of time looking at that. How can we take a large body of work and using better intake, playbooks, self-service, technology, continuous improvement, you know, handle thousands of contracts for a legal department. So those were my well, to follow up kind of on yeah. the machine learning thing, uh, so I work with a lot of in-house legal departments, it's all my clients, and they're, a lot of them are very large tech companies, so the, the bigger ones, you know, have got all the standard things like you're talking about the e-billing and the contract management and document management and e-discovery. So they're sort of pushing the envelope and looking at some of this machine learning uh, tools out there, and I made some notes here around natural language processing which is looking at, so there's a number of companies, and you mentioned a few of them, uh, that are out there looking at, for example, reading invoices from law firms and actually looking for inefficiencies, uh, and so that the, uh, and, and actually programming that looks at this, and there's companies out there that will say that, you know, they're getting two to three percent out of, you know, these invoices by doing this. There's ones out there, machine learning, that are reading your entire contracts database and looking at relationships, the risks, the terms, the obligations, the incentives, and, and then putting them into a database so you can actually catalog all of your contracts immediately by just using this software that go through and read them. Uh, Slack is a, you, I think you mentioned Slack. A number of my smaller tech companies that I work with are starting to use Slack, which is a, a team collaborative software that um, where they're actually the in-house counsel and their, their outside counsel are working together through teams on Slack and communicating and sharing documents that way. Uh, as that's something that some of the more progressive companies are looking at. And then this whole thing around Think Smart and process mapping. I don't know if you've looked at them. And they're a really new technology that's looking at uh, taking your standard processes that you use in a company, whether it's just onboarding employees to uh, running contracts through, and they actually come in and they'll, they'll put the process, automate it through your system using email and everything else, so you get automatic signatures and everything else, and it cuts uh, processing time for standard processes uh, dramatically. So those are some of the ones I wrote down. I have things smart and slack. Go ahead. Uh, I'm going to take it a slightly different angle. Um, I think there's a lot of amazing technologies out there, but I, for one, don't think I can possibly predict which one is going to pop and which one's going to be the next big thing. I write about it for Above the Law. I've seen, oh, I've interviewed a lot of the CEOs of various legal startups, invested in a few myself, and I have ones that I like and ones that I don't like. But uh, going back to the theme of, of, of my parents that, that you awed to after I asked you to, um, I think that the future of law is going to look a lot more like the past. I think that all the technologies are going to uh, 
enable people to do what they wanted to do when they went to law school, which is provide counsel, think critically about issues, and remove a lot of the kind of nonsense, honestly, a lot of it which came from modernity. We talked a lot about e-discovery. E-discovery is a problem that was created by technology. By creating predictive coding and things like that, all we're doing is getting back to where it was before, where lawyers sat down and read a lot instead of an unbelievable amount. Um, it, as opposed to changing the practice, I think a lot of it is bringing it back to where it was before. And I think that the, the, the technologies that will win are the ones that will you know, take people back to a place that they feel comfortable and where they're happy and where the clients are happy and where they can practice law. And the only thing I would say is just uh, looking at it a little farther out, not instead of just, th except I think you hit a lot of the, the good points that are happening in three, three years, five years. But what's going to look like 10 years, 20 years, 30 years? And the question is, is it will it be just further enabling how we practice law, supplementing how we practice law, or will it supplant the, the lawyers? And that's where a lot of us lawyers get a little nervous. Uh, uh, you know, I think we're a long way off from, from, from that, you know, particularly the more sophisticated uh, risk analysis and, and contracts, and, and I think there are going to be a lot of drags on it that we don't see, in particular, say, how, uh, how the, the big slow adopters are of governments and courts and in technology. Business continues to, be, uh, to increase in complexity. It's not getting simpler. Mm -hmm. So there's going to be those headwinds that we go in. If I could just add one thing to that, I think that's a great point, but I would hope that we as lawyers, if we see something that's so disruptive that it will solve our clients' problems without us needing to be there, we'd be the first ones to be pushing that, um, be involved with that right. business, help that business grow. There's lots of ways where we can have successful careers, and if you know that silver bullet comes, we should be happy. We can push that. Why isn't that happening? So why, what are the barriers? And I jumped the gun earlier because as a legal tech entrepreneur, all I see are barriers a lot of the times. Um, but what are the actual barriers to implementing technologies that logically seem cool, that seem interesting, that can help you? Um, and I think maybe we'll have to give it back to Mike for a moment to say, you know, what is actually the process of getting early new technologies approved at a larger company like Pearson? So, uh, uh, Putting it in the most simplest, simplest terms, that, that there are two, two uh, angles to this. One is the product that you want to have, the technology. The other is the reception on the other side, particularly from the IT group and the company. And I can give you just two examples of success and not, not so successful. Um, one is with the, the first one, which was very successful and relatively easy, was our e-billing uh, technology that we were able to implement. And we were able to first get our policies lined up right. We got our outside counsel's uh, guidelines set up. Um, we were able to demonstrate cost savings, both in reduction of outside counsel costs, as well as in-house in resources that were that was using in, in billing. Um, and we were able to push it through within within two months to get it through and, and start to start to implement. Um, now, fast forward a few months later and we have to get our litigation hold software in place. Um, the, the situation has changed. Budgets have become very tight. IT is going through a restructuring. They're trying to reduce the number of applications they have to, uh, to a third or less than what, what they have presently. Um, we then are presenting this, this uh, technology that doesn't have that immediate cost savings that's very attractive. Um, and, can, and, and there was a somewhat of a, a lack of understanding on our, on our IT people about what legal hold does and doesn't do. As a result, we've been trying since October 2015 to get this in place, and we're still not there. So, and it's both a pro an issue of the product and, and what we're trying to, to get through, as well as what's going on within the organization you're trying to get it, you're trying to get it through. Lots, and I think you had a good story also. Yeah, well, th what I've observed is that unless you're a law firm or a legal tech company, law is not the core business. So you go into any company, they're producing a product or a service or they're designing some cool technology. Law is not the core business. It's not a revenue driver. I know. <laughs> so what happens is you don't get the funding as readily. You don't even get the internal IT support. So to the question you had, we designed a dashboard for a client that really solved the legal department's needs to have matter tracking and financial real-time tracking. They loved it. Five months later, we still can't get IT to prioritize getting us through the firewall. 
So they can get onto this dashboard from their home computers and from their iPads, but from a company-issued laptop, they can't get through. And we've offered our IT folks, it's just not going to work. We also have a huge tech company that we ended up designing a technology solution, a dashboard for them, because it's sort of like the cobbler's children have no shoes. I mean, try to get tech resources when all the tech folks are focused on the next product launch. So I think that is one thing that is hard for in-house legal departments. And the best solution I've found is for you know everyone to be thinking about, how does this link through to a business output? I saw legal department's um, strategy plan for the year, and the title was, it's all about sales. Everything that legal department did was filtered through. How do we get this company's sales more rapidly closed, improve the sales, everything that the legal department did, and they really approached things differently and had more success getting tech. Um, acquired and implemented because they could tie it to exactly what the core strategic plan was for the whole company. I think sometimes lawyers are too siloed. We don't link it through as well as we should. Yeah, I, I, I agree with a lot of that. I uh, worked with Uber. I implemented uh, e-billing and uh, e-discovery and a number of things there. And biggest challenge we ran into is that the in-house lawyers are just so busy that to try and bring something new into them is really tough. And a lot of the new technologies are great, but none of them integrate with each other. Uh, and so when you get into total legal enterprise management, so Google, working with them, they have just about every system out there, but nothing talks from one to the next. So that's a big issue. And until, and because they're all different companies that build these different things, but the database structures are different and everything else is different. And uh, but I think the biggest thing is the fact that time issue of the in-house team of dealing with it and also having to learn another program and having a, another program that they have to bring up on their screen. Uh, there's some techno some companies that have been really smart and they've integrated it to, into like Outlook or Word or things like that so that it's fully integrated and, and they already are using those tools. So just another button there they can push and bring it up. But if they have to open up a whole other program and learn something completely new, then that's really tough for them and they just, you know, they, they don't want to deal with it. So because of the time restraint constraints. No, I was just going to add one point because one of the things that wasn't in your amazing slide deck that feeds off of what you talked about, Ken, I think one of the biggest challenges we're seeing right now, and I've spent a lot of time thinking about this, is we all want a dashboard. We all want to come in each morning and know what are the high priority projects, where are things trending against budgets and such. What's really interesting, because we work with Uber too, is they wanted a dashboard as part of the RFP, and we thought, well, okay, we can design a dashboard. But they have like probably 20 other firms they're regularly working with. Do they want to learn 20 firm dashboards? A lot of them probably use a SharePoint platform. Others are going to use HiQ. Others are going to be designed differently. And I thought, well, that's not going to be great. And then as a practicing lawyer that might work with 30 clients in a week, do I want to go into 30 different dashboards? No. Um, so it's almost like it should be treated like a utility. We should all create one platform that we're all using, because I want to come in, and regardless of which client, I know what my priorities are. Any in-house counsel wants to know, regardless of which firm's working on it, what do I need to get done? And I noticed that your dashboard may or may not have linked in to all the partners, vendors, firms. And I think that's going to be a real challenge for us to solve. I don't know how we're going to do it. And I think Joe had a comment. And I think a lot of my clients are starting to use Tableau for dashboards, mm -hmm. which is going to be really popular. Uh, just to look at it. I don't have a dashboard solution. I do not. So I work for, our, but it's interesting because I work for our legal outsourcing business, which was a startup, which is frankly one of the, the few startups in legal that has, you know, grown to be tens and tens of millions of dollars of business, and mostly through general counsel, mostly through corporate counsel. So when everyone's talking about the struggle with doing business with corporate counsel, all I can think is they're pretty easy to do business with. They're willing at least to think about adopting new things. To me, the big struggle, if you want to talk about the struggle in legal, it's law firms. And you said that you're not the business side, but law firms are. They're the business of law. Um, and I actually wrote an article about this for Above the Law last week, which I've never gotten more emails from. It really stirred the pot a little. 
They're businesses, but they're, they cannot incorporate. Um, they can't do what they can now do in the UK. So they can't, if they could drop the price 80% on, let's say, doing a lease or doing an NDA, would their market share go through the roof? Probably, but you have to you know, be an owner and have stock and be, you know, be recruiting the best technologists in the world um, to be able to put together a product or a service like that, and law firms simply are not doing it. So I think a lot of the, 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 the startups in the audience, um, I think the general counsels are your best friends. They, you know, they might not have a p and like the business side does, but they have skin in the game to lower costs, whereas you could create a wonderful solution for a law firm, and they often won't, actually won't want to do it, no matter how you know, demonstrably better it is than what they're doing currently. Struggle is real selling to law firms, I will tell you from personal experience. Struggle is real. Um, all right, so inevitably this is a panel about legal tech, so we have to ask the question, are robots going to replace lawyers? Um, but specifically, because generally the answer is no, but um, how will lawyering change as a result of using more automation and more technology? Well, I agree with sort of the comments at the, the end of the panel here about law will and that was one of the themes in the presentation, will enable us to spend more time actually doing the work that drove us to law school in the first place, whether it's you know a big social issue or uh, just something you're particularly interested in from a subject matter perspective. I think that that's the point. I think there's something about, you know, yeah, there's a lot of talk about law, you know, the practice of law being technical, but legal also comes down to fundamental, like, human questions, and I think we have a lot of human questions today, uh, more so than ever before. Uh, you can you can read the article on UpCounsel, just sort of on my take on that, but um, I, I'm very shocked when I hear people say that, oh, the, the profession is dying when I see more human questions today than we've ever had as a, as a human race. And uh, so I think we need more lawyers, we need more people thinking about those deeply and not in a way that a machine would think about them, but in the way that it, sort of a human being would think about them. And, and you know, then you get into some really crazy like Ray Kurzweil type discussions about, well, what does it, you know, what does that really mean? And, you know, I guess we'll find out. <laughs> <laughs> so, uh, no, I don't think they will. I do think that there's going to be technologies out there that are really going to help sort of the lower value point areas like document review and, and generation of, do, of contracts and things like that. But I think the technology all it's really going to do is they're going to be tools to help the lawyers be more efficient and be faster what they do so they can provide more value to their clients. I agree with all that. And I think we have to also remember that humans still like to solve problems with humans. Computers aren't going to be empathetic. And the other thing that I think is interesting is you can get all these data outputs out of a, um, a system. But we've all had that experience of sitting in the room with other humans and collaborating. And all of a sudden, you see just a shift in direction. And you're just going to take a different strategy. And I don't know that computers can as quickly do that. Um, you know, Really good at high volume, really repeatable processes, which I don't think humans really want to be doing anyway. Um, and, and then what we'll do is we'll take that information and we'll use it, um, you know, as one input as we, you know, work through it. I do want to, so I, the Google Xander I think is just such an interesting example and it's not something that's available for sale but it was a project that um, I heard described and it was such a great example of supervised machine learning. And what they did is they designed a system that could go look at I don't know, millions of patent applications and using that um, natural language, um, you know, search and review, try to figure out what patent applications might touch on Google patents. So it had a very defensive, protective strategy. They were able to do, um, I think they calculated the review that would normally take a lawyer three years to do. Now, that's assuming you could keep that lawyer willing to do that for three years. Um, the success rate was higher than any human because humans get tired and lazy and bored. And you could run it every three days. Um, so there's a great example where you're taking uh, a computerized system to do work that's highly valuable that no human would want to do anyway. And then the unexpected surprise out of it was what they realized that they picked up in doing this was where other companies are investing. 
where they're investing their R&D. The, the, you know, all these small patent applications, they showed trends and, and direction. So the legal department was able to go to the business and provide some of the most valuable business intelligence, which with what started as a very defensive, who's infringing on our patents. So I look at that and I think, now that's cool. That's exciting. And we should be absolutely welcoming the kinds of technologies that will help us go through these huge volumes of information we now can create and store, unfortunately. I mean, we have created our own problem. Um, and then we take that as lawyers and turn it into a business strategy. So I like that example. So one of the things that, that we really focus on as in-house counsel is trying to push our, push our people to the, to the most valuable work that they can, they can do. And technology really is helping us push us there to where we're most, to, where we can focus, where we add the most value. I have not had any situations where we have implemented technology, or do I envision situations, at least in the near future, of where we have envisioned technology where lawyers are going to say, "Wow, I wish I could review a thousand documents today." I mean, it's just th this is not why they necessarily went to law school. Now, what the law will look like in. 10 years from now and what our practice will be. I think it'll be more challenging because of the amount of data we'll have. There'll be more risk involved. It'll be very interesting to see, but it will not be static. Um, I, I think it really depends on the type of law. I actually do think in, in transactional and, and contracts law, a lot of those really are complex expert systems. And you know, within certain pain thresholds, a lot of that could actually filter through a very you know, sophisticated computer system with some people, but a very limited number of people sitting over it. I think with respect to litigation, um, I don't think much will change. I think it's going to be it's going to be more like a back to the future where um, you're removing the noise. But I mean, our system is literally set up so that people, you know, pitch ideas to other people and the answer is dependent on the, you know, those people's opinions. So I think the human element is almost baked into our system there and won't go away. Um, and this is mainly uh, a result of the question of in-house counsel's busy, and there's a lot of uh, sayings that there's not time to do this, even though it's going to save me time. So I know, um, Mike, you've used Accenture to implement some technologies, and then obviously we have Lawton and Ken who do this for a living. Um, so why, why would it be easier to go externally to implement technologies? Is there pros, cons, or should you go it alone? Well, we always think we can do and go it alone, but the reality is uh, I can give you one, one example where we have used uh, uh, it, through our law firm panel process where we're selecting uh, law firms in certain areas. Um, we would naturally think that we could just do that, do that ourselves. Um, the company was using Accenture for all their procurement activities and rather insistent we, we give them a try. And, and we did. And, and actually they brought together some skills, non-lawyer skills, um, in terms of being able to analyze data, um, put it in meaningful, uh, meaningful context for us to evaluate, um, as well as really negotiate with firms uh, effectively. Um, that, that's where it makes sense, for where, when, when, they, when they have the skills and technology that we just don't have. I'm trying to sort of remember the question. So where would you make sense to partner in terms of implementing where would in-house counsel, why would it make more sense to use a partner to help implement technology, review what technologies are the most appropriate, mm -hmm. and actually take the load off of in-house counsel to actually yeah. make this stuff happen? Yeah. I mean, I, I, one of the things I guess I would think is in a law firm, it is one of the tools of our trade. It's what we're doing all day, every day. So there may be times where a law firm has just spent more time and energy looking at what's out there, doing beta testing. I know we're testing all the time new products, so it may help accelerate that, but I think also um, other partners could help you with that as well. I think what I hope for, too, is bringing more um, brains to the table than just lawyers. I think so often lawyers try to solve problems with lawyers, so I think any time you can involve technology, business folks from your company that are the end receivers of your legal output, um, and really bring different thinking. And I don't, I think that's where you're gonna get your best solutions for do, are we solving the right problem? Do we have the right technology identified? And then have we built a strategy to bring it in and support and train and get adoption? Because 
You see all so many examples of you buy it, you think it's going to fix everything, and you haven't built the system around to actually do a good implementation. So I guess my point is I think any time you can get more than just the lawyers in the room to solve the problem, you're probably going to get a much better adoption and implementation. So we'll ask the non-lawyer on the panel. <laughs> Why do they need you? <laughs> Uh, well, just, you know, I was at HP for 26 years, and it's the same in any company, not even the legal department, but you, you focus on your core competency, and if your core competency is engineering and not HR, you know, then why do you have, you know, why don't you look at bringing in people that really focus on that and using outsourcing or using vendors to do that? And the same thing when you're implementing technology. I mean, the law department are lawyers, they're not technologists. And you know their, their core competency is doing law and not doing technology, and the technology people are technology not doing law, and so you partner with them and you bring them in because you know you want to focus on what you your highest and best use, as you were talking about, Mike. Yeah, I'm gonna I'm gonna build off of that just from my experience implementing um, Aptis into Salesforce for my last organization. You know, you you, you pitch this to you know, maybe your CEO and your COO, and they're like, the lawyer's gonna do this. You know, I'm sorry, but you really need to get the backing of your your CTO, and sometimes that takes. You know, we're going to bring in an implementation team to do to set this up. And uh, when we started our implementation, I didn't really have a full appreciation for all the the data entry that was going to have to happen, and all the you know the workflows that were going to have to be built out, and and like testing and testing and testing and bugs and. Uh, it's not something that lawyers are trained to to really deal with. So I think it, it all depends on sort of your resources, but I really recommend if you're not going to partner with an outside firm, an implementation third party, at least get some key stakeholders within your, your IT department or get the backing of your CTO to sort of make sure you have the resources you need to pull it off. Because it's easy to, to put to, to, uh, to do these slides and talk about how great a contract management system is, but to ap actually implement one for a big enterprise, it's, uh, I mean, it, it can be a year, year long effort. So uh, the help helps. All right, we have time for a couple questions. All right. Uh, Jack. So um, I'm going to make a few shameless plugs. So I, I, <laughs> I'm at Simple Legal. I appreciate Ian's mention of what we're doing. Um, we're actually trying to build a dashboard. So you alluded to a, a dashboard. We're actually in the business of, if we think we can build it better, uh, we'll build it ourselves. If not, we'll, we'll integrate with whatever, whoever does it better. So in the instance of Tableau, uh, we're working with a major fortune company to basically take the data in our e-billing and management system and then make it you know, way more of a business intelligence tool by you know, sending our data into that. Um, we think we can build contract management better, so we actually just built contract management, and I, I actually can't keep people off of me for it. It, it. It's so amazing that such a simple tool of storing contracts and tracking metadata has been over-engineered by every provider in the space. Um, and so, so yeah, so I was making a... a, a, a couple of shameless talks. The last thing I just wanted to say there is I'm sort of surprised that no one mentioned legal operations. So um, actually, Mike, you, you have a legal operator within Pearson. I actually yes. met her at the COP conference a few weeks okay. ago. Um, legal operations is actually the person you're talking about, the person there to implement technology within legal departments. It is the MBA side of the legal department where their sole focus is to buy technologies that improve efficiencies within, and so there's this, there's, if anyone has heard of CLOCK, it's the Consortium of Legal Operations. They just had a conference where there was, I think, between 500 and 1,000 people there. And it was the first time they ever had it, so I think, what's that? 500 people, 140 companies. Yeah, and so, and so we were there, and it was sort of amazing to see the proliferation of technologies in, in, in an exponential way due to the rise of legal operations, because, like someone mentioned, uh, legal departments are seen as a cost center. And so how do you make that a more effective cost center by allowing them to grow and protect the company and keeping things like you know, your legal spend and other things in, in track? But my question is ultimately, we talked about, or you talked about you know, multiple different technologies and you know, e-discovery, e-billing, all that. I'm curious if there's something that you, anyone on this panel has seen where there's not technology servicing that area today. I mean, like, uh, well, I, I think actually, and I was talking to someone else about this today, that uh, I think what's to come is actual, like, practice areas. 
So IP is one where we're doing a lot, but I could see a ton of work being done on the immigration system. And just taking entire regulations and just coding them into platforms and, and really you know, making that more accessible and scalable to people. So I think if there's maybe the next step in this is actual subject matter uh, and uh, breaking that down and making it more digestible and making the, the sort of the, the motion practice or you know, whatever the ins and outs are. So uh, that would be one area, like subject matter practice, where I could see widgets popping up or uh, you know, even applications where, the sorry to say, take the lawyer out of the equation and uh, literally just um, a human and a government entity sort of communicating through some sort of application. So I would say practice areas. An area I see, so in my practice, I work with companies, uh, in-house departments, moving them off hourly fees and onto value-based fee arrangements. Uh, at Uber, we don't do anything on hourly fees anymore. Um, and I've got a number of other companies that want to go that direction. The problem is, is that there's no technology out there that really does that well in terms of matter management, in terms of e-billing. Uh, the e-billing solutions out there don't do it well. Uh, and it's all, what's that? You, you do a little bit. So, so Snapchat's one of my clients, okay. So, yep. But it doesn't work that great still in terms of <laughs> managing it. So. I uh, just, I'm being honest, um, there's some things that, you know, it could be done better and because, you know, you look at, you know, look at matters in terms of the actual value of the matter and looking at actually lowering what you're paying for the effort and focusing more on, uh, on results and success. Uh, and that's, you know, where I think a lot of the legal is going right now, the legal industry is going. And, there's really not a lot of technology out there that's able to manage that well. I'll, I'll put in my vision, and it's simpler, similar to what Mike was saying kind of 20 years out. Having been an employment litigator, the thing that I, it drove me crazy and where I am today is looking at the amount of waste in the litigation dispute resolution machine. You know, think about how much money our country spends resolving disputes. If you could remove the lawyers on both sides out of that dispute resolution machine, we'd have so many more resources available for more productive activities. So I, you know, in my vision in 20 years is that we have a streamlined way to just resolve disputes and get the lawyers and the plaintiff's lawyers, everyone out of the mix and have a more direct way to do that. And it's interesting that Lex Machina is analyzing in IP litigation all of the, the decisions that have happened by judges and, and all the non-reported decisions and what arguments work. And I thought what's interesting there is it could enable people to resolve those disputes much more efficiently because you're taking a lot of the surprise out of it. And a lot of litigation is about predicting things that you think might happen or could happen or how decisions. If you could actually make that a lot more efficient or ultimately have just a... Um, I don't know, some different approach. And I know you're shaking your head. You're like, the jury system's not going anywhere. But it is a very complicated system for resolving disputes in a lot of instances. And I think that's a big area of waste. But I don't know that, that can be solved. But I'm dying to hear what you're about to say, Joe. You're <laughs> oh, it's, it's super wasteful. But Americans love litigation. You just can't take that pleasure away from them. <laughs> I don't, I, I don't buy it. It's, our, it's like our national pastime besides baseball. So, <laughs> no, I mean, I, I couldn't agree with you more. You're totally right. I just, I actually don't see it happening. And I think it's part of kind of, I actually think it's part of our culture and part of the fabric of our society. And, and that's not necessarily true in other parts of the world. That is a uniquely American. So you, 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 you're right, but, but uh, I, would, I would be shocked if it actually happened. Okay, that's why I said it's visionary. I wasn't going to say it, yeah. but Mike opened the <laughs> door. Uh, let's take one last question from Carlos, and then we'll wrap it up and do our Darwin talk. I, uh, I actually had a, a similar question to, to you mentioned uh, dispute resolution, and, and I was wondering like, why no one mentioned that the GC of the 2020 would be interacting with some dispute resolution pools. Are, are you doing it now? What's the. I think it is an area that hasn't been tackled. Because apparently we love it. It's like reality <laughs> TV. We can't <laughs> stop. I'm not aware of that. Has anyone, has anyone ever um, fought a park, uh, speeding ticket? So that, that's it right there in a nutshell. It's like, so much fun. I mean, when you go, and I mean, I got it on the LIE. So I'm on 
the LIE and you know you go to drive out to the middle of Long Island you know and there's a cranky judge and a hundred people there and you waste your whole day you waste you're not at the office you know there's no reason why and I agree with you about you know litigation like I have a, actually a brother who works for Gawker and that's like a huge story like we love we like those fireworks cases but for little things like speeding tickets like I really I have to go to court when we have things like Skype and I could probably just you know virtually dispute this thing um, you know I really don't see why we can't modernize a court system and smaller more you know lesser uh, uh, you know impactful uh, you know just at, at that level you know you start start let's start with speeding tickets and then we can work our way up to you know criminal or, or something else all right, so um, we're going to do very last wrap up, which is your best tip or suggestion for in-house attorneys who are looking to implement legal tech. And then we're going to launch into our Darwin talk and I'll give you the background on that. So starting with an interesting thought provoking presentation and ending with an interesting thought provoking presentation. So what is your best tip? So the best tip for if you're a legal department looking to implement legal tech, um, my best tip is to um, show um, show your CEO or CEO how um, how the the risk really make it um, it's 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 good to show that we talked about the um, sort of the the financial sort of cost benefit analysis but I think when you actually show like someone this is where our, our contracts are look at this you know literally drag them into a room, show them the system, show them the what's better, and I think actually seeing it uh, is important in making the, the pitch. I would say bring in a legal operations function into your legal department um, because they are project managers, they know how to do this, they understand the technologies, and uh, they can make it happen and don't try and do it on your own because it's just too hard for the lawyers to do that. So my recommendation would be to go low tech, low fidelity, minimum viable product pilot group and see if anyone even starts to use it because if they're not, you're, maybe we're solving the wrong problem. Maybe there isn't going to be the investment, there's not a pain point, the urgency isn't there, so you could spend a lot of time and money solving for something that never gets used because it really wasn't the right problem or the right moment in time. So start small and then see if you start to build that momentum and uptake. So I had three. I can only remember two. Um, the uh, um, just, but just, uh, just play. one is prioritize. Uh, you can't do. I think if you're doing more than two at one time, it becomes very difficult. Um, the second is understand your users. Um, don't implement technology if you, if your if your lawyers are not prepared for it and are and are really willing and, and able to use it. Um, so, Jake, is your name Jake? Jack. Um, so my, mine is uh, pay attention. You're never going to know what the next big thing is going to be. You can't predict the future. But there are a lot of people out here with really good ideas. And in legal, unlike the rest of the business world, there's not thousands of them. There's like 20 or 30. Like, let, let Jack come to your office and tell you. He's going to pitch. He's going to give you a couple pitches. But maybe just maybe he has an awesome idea behind it. And I think it's, it's particularly, I mean, sales is brutal for every profession. But I think in law, it's bizarrely brutal because there just aren't that many people out there with new ideas trying to shake it up. And if you have a mandate to lower costs and make it more efficient, you know, give Jack a few minutes. Like, let him in. <laughs> and as a, as a legal tech entrepreneur, I'll add one, one thought to that. So, so very last thought is um, actually give product feedback. So if you don't like it, don't not buy it. Actually say, it would be cool if we could do this, this, and this. Like, um, Kim was suggesting some improvements. That would be really helpful to those out here. You might not buy our product now, but we'll go back, we'll fix whatever you didn't like, and we'll come back to you after that. So thank you to our illustrious panel. Um, we can give them a quick round of applause. And then I would like to very I would like to introduce Chris Endy. So Chris is the managing director of pricing and project management at Goodwin Proctor, where he oversees the development and implementation of pricing and legal project management. 
Um, he's done a lot of stuff on AFAs and spent a long time at Goodwin, but also spent a little time in the Suffolk County Dif District Attorney's Office where he was assigned to the gang unit. So he's going to be talking. He's going to do a, like a, a very short Darwin talk to end it off, which is what we like to do at these Evolve Law events, called Investment in Technology and AFAs, a Chicken or Egg Dilemma. All right. Well, um, thank you, first of all, to Jules and Evolve Law for having me. Um, this whole thing is so much cooler than I am um, and big law in general. So this is a great um, sort of refreshing uh, group to be a part of. Um, I spend my whole day thinking about pricing legal services to clients, um, all different kinds of clients, um, small tech companies, huge financial institutions. Um, I've been doing it for about five years. Um, and I spend every waking moment thinking about alternative fee arrangements and struggling with how to implement them, how to get traction both with the law firm and with the client. And so when I was talking to Jules about thinking about alternative fee arrangements and technology, we said, well, this is going to be a great, amazing fit, right? Because clearly, if we implement technology and we do a better job, it can drive the use of alternative fee arrangements and more predictable outcomes and all these great things. And so this is fantastic. So I thought, five, 10 minute Darwin talk, piece of cake. We started thinking about it. And it got really hard. Um, and it got to this sort of chicken and egg thing. And um, for purposes of the talk, and this is the most important part, technology is the chicken and the AFA is the egg, um, just because. I just made that up. Um, but I started thinking about it and I said, well, does technology really drive AFAs? And, and you can definitely come up with some ways it does. And Ken sort of alluded to systems you could think about that would help drive more creative fee arrangements. So for example, if you had a great tool that could really mine your matter data, and whether you're on the corporate legal side or the law firm side, and you had an amazing tool that could tell you that you've done you know, 200 M&As that look just like the one you're going to do, how much it costs, how many hours, what the resources were, what the outcomes were, um, you could do a better job price. You can have more comfort around saying, OK, I have, I have a good sense of what this should cost. I want my law firm to do it on a fixed fee. right? Um, or you could think about a law firm who says, I'm going to invest in technology so I can do a particular type of project more efficiently. And I'm going to get really good at that. And I'm going to go to market with a lower fixed fee, um, undercut my competition, um, and gain more work and more market share. So I do think that the chicken can come before the egg. And there are certainly ways that you can think about doing that to drive better, more creative pricing arrangements. But my theory today is I think it's more fun, actually, to talk about the egg coming before the chicken. And I think it's. In a world where it's so hard to get adoption of alternative fee arrangements, and you've heard about it forever, and yet every statistic you see in terms of the usage hasn't changed hardly at all in like the last three or four years. It's just hovering around the we're dabbling in it sort of range. Um, and my theory would be if we just dive in with both feet a little more often and try it and figure out what works and what doesn't work, that actually helps us drive technology in a way that there's a real carrot there to invest in something and to do it better. And my thought is, I'll, I'll, I'll sort of help prove my theory with one, one sort of simple story, which is a couple of years ago, we had one of our biggest clients come to us and just decree that they're moving all their litigation to fixed fee. And we had a ton of it. And it was small, but a lot of it was big and really complex and multi-year, um, huge stakes. And we said, OK. And I'm the guy who gets stuck. You know, well, how are we going to do this? Um, and it was kind of fun. So we talked it through. And I said, OK, well, let's talk to the client. It was like, easy way to do this, right? We're going to do it by phases, right? You, know, you eat the elephant one bite at a time. We'll do it by phases. We'll chunk it out. You have fact discovery, expert discovery, pretrial trial, easy to do. And we invested in a little bit of technology just to try to get our systems to, to track that way. And we dove in. And Within a couple months, it really wasn't working like at all. And here was the problem. Big cases, we're trying to code into these buckets. And things start to overlap. And there's multiple phases. And they're all going at once. And then there's work that's not in a phase. And no one knows where to put it. And the client's saying, well, how are we doing? 
I don't know, we have four phases going on, they're all cranking away, um, well, what am I gonna spend the next six months? I don't know, we don't know when the phases are gonna end. You know, it didn't work, right? So we stopped, we hit the pause button, we said, well, wait a minute, you know, is your concern how much you're gonna spend the next couple months? Because we can actually do that. So if we're chunking out not by phase, but by quarter, that's a lot more predictable, and we can put some scope around that. So we went a completely different path, and we started down that road. And it led to these great discussions with our client over and over. Scope, objectives, what are you trying to accomplish? Regular phone calls, and before you knew it, you were at the next quarter. So more discussions, more phone calls, better collaboration, and then the attorney's coming to me saying, I need to track this better, Chris. Where is our systems? Where are our tools? Okay, let's build something. Um, let's build tracking reports once a week. Not good enough, I need daily. Okay, let's build daily reports. Here you go, here's how you're doing. Not good enough, I need timekeeper, I need task, I need, and all of a sudden we're investing in new technology, not because we're looking ahead, because we have to deal with rights and what's right in front of us. Um, and it worked really well. Client was very happy. And was it huge investment in technology? Is it artificial intelligence? Is it you know, big automation? No, but it's a great starting point. And it was easy to do because we were already had a reason to do it. And at the end of the day, you know, two great benefits for me was, one, I have attorneys thinking differently about how they do their work, which drives them to think differently about other work, about how they can do things more efficient with other clients. And we have a system and a tool that helps us to now go to clients and say, we actually have a way that works, and let's talk about how we can scale that with other clients. And we can have the conversation to say, we know what doesn't work so well, and that's driven us to actually go be more proactive about how we think about alternative fee arrangements. So, simple story. This isn't big, this isn't Ian. He, Ian's the, not chicken egg, you're the like, free range omelet with like avocado foam and you know, but, um, I think it's fun to think about, you know, when the egg can come before the chicken and if we can really help drive technology that way. There's my pitch. So thank you very much. Thank you everyone for coming. I think we're here till nine, so please eat, drink, schmooze and visit the companies who are here. Thank you to Workbench uh, for hosting us and enjoy. Hi, I'm, I'm Marco Blatt. I'm the founder of Valku. Uh, Valku is a platform for automating legal transactions. Um, we do in corporations. Right now it's a lot of startups coming on here and doing it. There's solo attorneys as well coming on and incorporating companies. It's done the way it would be done in Silicon Valley. Um, Vesting, a number of other bells and whistles. We uh, have also built tools for automating a number of other transactions, more difficult ones. Um, they're self-serve. You can set up your own transaction, whether it's a venture financing transaction or even more complicated than that. Um, and we're building out some of these transactions as open source. Um, beyond that, I'm, I'm working very heavily on a cap table solution right now. I know it's a crowded space, um, but uh, pretty excited with what we've built and. Um, Hope to hope that take that out as soon, um, but overall, uh, we think that companies are going to live online on platforms, and um, we hope that uh, we win that game, and uh, we're building the pieces towards that. Hi, my name is Eugene. I'm with Hire and Esquire. Hire and Esquire is an online legal labor marketplace. We connect law firms and legal departments with an on-demand attorney workforce. We have a network of about 5,000 attorneys nationwide that are available through our online platform. So legal departments and law firms can sign up to become a client. It's really kind of the marriage of a job board and online dating because you can post a job and have people apply, but you can also have immediate access to attorney profiles, search, run searches, add filters and search uh, functionality, and find the type of people that you're looking for. When you find a profile you're interested in, all you have to do is invite them to apply. Hi, my name is Nehal Madani. I'm the CEO of Alt Legal. What we do is we help companies and law firms create, manage, and analyze their intellectual property filings like trademarks, patents, and copyrights. We do it in a more automated and intuitive way than what's available today. What a law firm will do is use our software to collect information from clients, take that information to instantly generate new IP filings, and then once everything's filed, we take care of the hardest part, 
which is tracking them, keeping track of the statuses, all the deadlines, we do that automatically by connecting directly to government office databases. Hi, I'm Jack Trifus. I am the director of sales for Simple Legal. Uh, Simple Legal is modern e-billing, matter management, and most recently contract management. We are the sales force or the dashboard for general counsel to make their lives a heck of a lot easier so they can concentrate on growing and protecting their company. And we help them take care of all of their operational work, all of the overhead dealing with outside counsel, all of the overhead dealing with their sales departments. Um, and that's Simple Legal. Uh, hi, I'm uh, Mary Iman. I'm uh, direct, Director of Project Management for eBrevia, and we automate uh, contract review uh, as well as uh, lease abstraction, and we make the due diligence process for various contracts much more efficient and accurate. Uh, we've licensed the technology from Columbia University, and we've been uh, uh, in business since 2011. Hi, this is Jules, and I'm here with Carlos, who's the Senior Director of Innovation for the Legal Business at Thomson Reuters, um, and he's going to tell us a little bit more about what they're doing. So, Carlos, what is innovation for you, and what kind of cool stuff are you working on? So, innovation is, is something uh, where Thomson Reuters is very invested in. Obviously, uh, we are a large enterprise. Uh, the legal business unit is really focused right now on launching uh, or, or working more with customers and with um, with startups that, that's the part of the reason why we're here uh, because we realized we can't do everything ourselves and uh, as you saw from the the panel today a lot of the challenges have to do with integration of the multiple offerings that are out there in the ecosystem that's that's something that we're trying to figure out is how do you how do we integrate and not just integrate but how do we collaborate with the ecosystem and um, I, th I think that's still a work in progress for us that's why we're here and we're not gonna solve everything and, and I think uh, there's gonna be a lot of interesting uh, solutions and, and offerings coming out of former practitioners that understand the problems well and that can team with other uh, technologists and practitioners that want to solve them. So be a little specific what do you think the most interesting stuff in legal tech is right now for you? I think, um, well, definitely, uh, de definitely, uh, cognitive computing, uh, artificial intelligence, however you want to call it, uh, that's something that uh, you know we are developing expertise on or in. And uh, the, I, I think the, the the most important piece, though, and it's often overlooked, is the user experience. And you know that's something where we're heavily investing in as well. Um, you need to get or you need to have a very clear understanding of the problems that are being faced by the actual persona or the actual user of a product. And as products are more and more vertical, how those products are gonna integrate with the enterprise's products, especially when you're looking at in-house counsel uh, that don't get to make the decisions, the purchasing decisions entirely on technology. Um, so the, I, th I think those, the, uh, the probably user experience integration Cognitive computing and the application of automation into the workflow will be will be big things for us. And uh, at Thomson Reuters, that's something we're you know heavily looking at. And I think the other the other piece is just um, and it's it's sort of dependent on this. It's expertise and practice area knowledge, right? Because workflows will vary depending on the person and depending on the practice. Uh, and it's not just about serving up a vast amount of data, making search better, and it, it really is about embedding the data, the right data, at the right point in time in a certain workflow for a certain type of practitioner. And I think that's the probably the biggest innovations we're going to start seeing from Thomson Reuters. Cool. And then last question, why is Thomson Reuters even interested in the early, early stage legal tech space? And uh, we're very thankful that you're involved because there's a lot of cool stuff happening, but why do you care? Well, I think, you know, it, it's, uh, innovation is really going to come from everywhere. We're, we, uh, we're definitely not uh, sole proprietors of innovative products. And, uh, and it's interesting to see how people are approaching the same problems that we're dealing with in different ways, right? So you're going to have 
uh, contract management systems that are heavily reliant on artificial intelligence. You're going to have contract management systems that are heavily reliant on user experience. Same problem, right? Uh, but it's interesting, at least uh, for us, to understand how different people approach a similar problem. And we learn from each other. I mean, it's, we need to be part of the ecosystem, and uh, we want to be better partners for the ecosystem as well because we understand that that's the only way we're going to involve our own offerings. Awesome. Well, thank you very much, and thank you. Thank you. For